All right. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Paideia Institute online lecture series. Um, I'm happy to invite Indra Kagus McEwen today um, to talk about her new book, Vitruvius in an Age of Princes. Um, Indra Kagus McEwen is an architect, historian, and affiliate professor of art history <clears throat> at Concordia University in Montreal. She has taught at several different universities, as well as for 13 years in the scenography department at the National Theatre School of Canada. She holds an honors BA in English and Philosophy, Queen's University, Canada, as well as a professional degree in architecture, a master's in architectural history and theory, and a doctorate in art history, McGill University. In addition to many articles and book chapters, her publications include Socrates' Ancestor, an essay on architectural beginnings, MIT Press, 1993, Vitruvius, Writing the Body of Architecture, MIT Press, 2003, and Ordinance for the Five Kinds of Columns, a translation from the French of Claude Perrault's 17th century treatise on architecture, published with an introduction by Alberto Perez Gomez, the Getty Center, 1994. Her most recent book, All the King's Horses, Petruvius in an Age of Princes, was published by the MIT Press earlier this year. Her research has received generous support from the Graham Foundation, the Getty Foundation, the Canadian Center for Architecture, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Shall I start? Okay. Well, thank you very much, first of all, to the Paideia Institute. It's an honor and a privilege to have been invited to give this talk. And thank you all for coming. It's really wonderful that so many of you have agreed to spend a part of your Sunday with Vitruvius and me. I'd also like to thank the MIT Press for producing the handsome volume that my new book, All the King's Horses, has turned out to be. I'm grateful to the institutions that Megan already mentioned, the Graham Foundation, Getty Foundation, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and last, and it's worth repeating, most certainly not least, the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal. Why isn't it advancing? Okay. Um, it was in the study room at the CCA that my ongoing relationship with the ancient Roman author Vitruvius and his venerable text on architecture first took root nearly 30 years ago. It's been a long and fruitful relationship, as I say. The initial result was my first book on Vitruvius, Vitruvius Writing the Body of Architecture, which dealt with De Architectura in the context of the time of its writing, over 2000 years ago. That is to say, in ancient Rome in the first century BCE, at the fall of the Roman Republic and the beginning of one man rule known as the empire. In this photograph is a model I made of what I imagined the 10 books that make up De Architectura would have looked like when Vitruvius first wrote them on 10 papyrus scrolls. Vitruvius has been to architects what Hippocrates is to medical doctors, where Hippocrates enjoins doctors to, quote, do no harm. Vitruvius tells architects that their buildings must have firmitas, utilitas, venustas, strength, use, and beauty. To Vitruvius, we owe Vitruvian man, so-called, the man of perfect proportions, indelibly branded by Leonardo da Vinci's famous drawing. Like Hippocrates, Vitruvius remains an authority figure, often quoted, seldom read. Vitruvius's self-appointed aim was to write a comprehensive treatise on the topic, what he called the whole body of architecture. Of his 10 books, the first seven are on building and cover everything from the laying out of cities to materials, temples, public buildings, private construction, and finally finishes matters like mosaics, plaster, and mural painting, which are the topic of book seven. Book eight is on water, and book nine on what he called nomonike, or the construction of clocks. Book 10, by far the longest of the 10 books, is on machinery, including the machinery of war, 
which was Vitruvius's own specialty. Vitruvius had served Julius Caesar as a military architect, designing siege machinery during the great general's conquest of Gaul, which is something that would greatly enhance his appeal to the princely builders of the Renaissance. In this first book on Vitruvius, I concluded that imperial ideology underwrote the composition of De Architectura, written for Augustus Caesar around 25 BCE, as an argument for the necessary role of architecture in the Roman project of world dominion. Architecture, in other words, first acquired precise delineation as a discipline, as the discipline, the discipline that, quote, demonstrates everything the other arts achieve, as Vitruvius put it, in mutual interdependence with the imperial project of fashioning the world as a single Roman body. My new book, all the King's Horses, Vitruvius in an Age of Princes, is a sequel to this and concerns Vitruvius's afterlife in the early Italian Renaissance. De Architectura was not widely read in antiquity. The situ situation changed dramatically with its recovery nearly a millennium and a half later, when, as the only surviving classical source on architecture, the work acquired virtually unchallenged authority for anyone interested in reviving the ancient art of building and much else besides. A relative unknown in his own day, Vitruvius became a Renaissance celebrity. Why? My one-line answer would be because of his imperial credentials. The opening address to his patron, Augustus Caesar, could not be more explicit. When your divine mind and power, Imperator Caesar, were seizing command of the world and all your enemies had been crushed by your invincible virtus and citizens were glorying in your triumph and victory and all subjected peoples awaited your nod and so on and so forth. But why, to press the point, were Vitruvius's imperial credentials so appealing in the early At Italian Renaissance? Why at that particular point in time? The answer to this lies in their relevance to the politics of the day, the period between the mid 14th and late 15th century, when throughout Italy, warrior princes, each a would-be Caesar, were taking control of cities that had governed themselves as free, independent communes for the 200 years and more preceding their takeover. Vitruvius's role in the fulfillment of that autocratic agenda is the focus of my book. My argument is that the rebirth, so-called, of antiquity we call the Renaissance was founded in imperial ambition for which architecture al antica, architecture in the ancient style, that is to say, became an essential legitimator. The politics, in my view, was primary. Aesthetic choices came second. Ambrogio Lorenzetti's famous fresco cycle in Siena about the results of good and bad government is, among other things, a specific reference to the conflict between the communities, the communes on the one hand, and the warlords battling to take them over on the other. <clears throat> Central to Lorenzetti's well-governed city is its Piazza Comunale, the city square where during the communal era, notions of public utility and the common good took concrete shape in the unambiguous reality of shared inhabitable space at the center of an ideally open city. <laughs> Lorenzetti has made this place the incandescent source of the light that brings his entire painted city to life. The badly covered city is the result of one man rule the rule of self-interest demonized in the tyrant Lorenzetti calls Tiramides. It is an ugly, crime-ridden city, rife with scenes of rape, arson, pillage, and murder. Its buildings are in ruins. 
There is no Piazza Comunale. Enthroned in his castle, Tiramides presides over a court of vices where justice lies dying, roped into a shroud. Quote, there where justice is bound, no one is ever in accord for the common good, reads the legend under the painting. Could, tira <coughs> Sorry. Could a tyrant's city ever be beautiful? Might beauty play a role in recalibrating the perception of one man rule? As Caesar's architect, might Vitruvius be of use? That, stripped to its very barest essentials, is what my new book is about. The argument is developed in a prologue, six chapters of varying length, and an epilogue. Among the many editions and translations, oops, why isn't it advancing? It's supposed to advance. Yeah, there we go. Among the many editions and translations of De Architectura published in the Renaissance, one of them, or rather its frontispiece, is a summation of the political agenda Vitruvius was made to serve. The translation was published in 1535. Surrounding its title with its arresting two-color typography is a historiated frame dense with imitage, images. Not one of these images evokes anything resembling a reference, direct, oblique, or even distantly symbolic, to what is conventionally understood as the topic of the work being translated, which is to say, architecture. Instead, you have Roman military trophies piled up in vertical panels on either side of the title. Famous military men on horseback, Caesar and Augustus, the ruthless late Republican general Cornelius Sulla and Alexander the Great charge across the top and bottom of the page, scattering weaponry abandoned by what you assume are fleeing enemies. The unremitting glorification of horsemanship, war and conquest in the frame surrounding the title of this translation makes Vitruvius a key part of its celebratory imperial rhetoric. The rest of my book is a discussion of how he performed that role in an age of princes. Conventional wisdom has it that the Renaissance began with Francesco Petrarca. So too did Vitruvius's Renaissance afterlife. For it was Petrarch who first discovered a manuscript of De Architectura in the 1350s, 60 years before Poggio Bracciolini's rather better publicized discovery of 1416. My first chapter shows, shows how Petrarch's interest in the treatise was shaped by his political allegiances. Petrarch hated cities. For him, communal governments were little more than an excuse for mob rule. To be supplanted by the rule of princes he saw as agents of the renewed Roman grandeur he longed for. His heroes were the conquerors you saw celebrated in the previous image, Caesar, Augustus, Alexander, Sulla, but most especially Julius Caesar, whom Petrarch saw as the ideal model for the princes of his own day. Petrarch, so-called father of humanism, was a point of origin for the dissemination of Vitruvius's treatise and its embedded ideology. This late, oops, go back. This late 14th century manuscript of De Architectura copied from Petrarch's own was made for the famous Visconti Library at Pavia founded by Galeazzo II Visconti, Duke, the Duke of Milan, who was Petrarch's patron. The rector of this first of the 39 folios that make up the manuscript is illuminated and contains Vitruvius's opening address to Augustus Caesar, when your divine mind and power, Imperator Caesar, receiving command of the world and so on. <clears throat> At the top left, the initial capital C of the first word on the page, cum, when, frames the bust of a man portrayed against a blue ground. His clothing identifies him as a prince, probably Galeazzo II himself. He's about to open a book, 
de architettura, the book which itself opens with the letter C that frames him. In the bottom margin on the left, a plainly dressed man portrayed against a gold leaf background reads from an open book, also de architettura, listening attentive, attentive, attentively from his own gold leaf tondo at the right, is an imposing white haired figure caped and crowned in ermine. The reader on the bottom left is clearly meant to be Vitruvius and the personage listening to him, the emperor for whom Vitruvius wrote his treatise. Both are denizens of the ancient Roman world, their gold leaf halos render transcendent in an apotheosis that is a perfect reflection of Petrarch's own enthusiasms. Vitruvius's address to Augustus Caesar is at the same time a dedication to the reigning prince of the day who here presides over the opening of the work from his blue window at the top of the page. There are no more illustrations in the manuscript after this. The importance attached to this dedication, an importance which would persist throughout the subsequent history of the work, brings into sharp focus the perception of a cont continuity between Imperial Rome and the present Renaissance age of princes who style themselves as its rightful heirs in the face of increasingly futile attempts by Italian communes to maintain their viability. When Petrarch became poet laureate at Rome in 1341, the city was still a commune. Its beating heart was the marketplace known as the Campidoglio, the shared public place on the capital where the poet was crowned in the senatorial palace that dominated the area. Chapter two follows the conversion of what was then an unpaved, rather haphazard center of municipal government into the rigidly symmetrical space it became under papal rule, a place developed with in keeping with the principles first theorized by Vitruvius, which transformed the erstwhile Piazza Comunale into a site of papal ambition. With the bronze equestrian statue of the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius erected at its center in 1528, and through what was understood as the recovery of its ancient imperial splendor, the place that in the communal period had been the heart of Roman public life became palpable architectural proof that the Pope and not the people now ruled the city. Significantly enough, the starburst pavement that this engraving of 1568 shows radiating from the bronze horseman in insistence of its central position was not actually executed until 1940 under the fascist government of Benito Mussolini, who seems to have grasped better than anyone its peremptory imperial discourse. Many consider the Campidoglio the most beautiful square in Rome. During the 13th and 14th centuries, heads of powerful families seeking to wrest control of Italian cities from progressively weaker communal governments were all confronted by the same hurdle, their lack of legitimacy. Vitruvius and especially his Renaissance mediator, Leon Battista Alberti, would successfully promote architecture as a preferred means of surmounting that title, that obstacle. Chapter three examines the architectural appropriation of Urbino by the warlord Federico da Montefeltro, whose residence, as Baldassare Castiglioni famously wrote, was una città in forma di palazzo, a city in the form of a palace. A palace whose gigantic footprint obliterated every trace of the city's communal institutions and replaced them with the unassailable fact of its own overwhelming presence. An ancient Roman graffito from Nero's day made precisely the same point concerning the emperor's sprawling palace at the center of Rome, uh, the famous golden house, if some of you may have heard of it. 
the sprawling palace at the center of Rome, but with, with none of Castiglione's enthusiasm. Rather the opposite, in fact. Quote, get out of here, citizens, wrote the anonymous author of the Roman insp inscription. Rome is turning into one man's house. I'm sure many people in late 15th century Urbino felt the same way about Federico's gigantic pile. In 1476, Giovanni Sulpizio da Veroli, or Sulpicius Verulanus, it was very popular to Latinize your, your, no, your name at the time. Uh, Sulpizio, who 10 years later would edit the first printed edition of Vitruvius, was resident at Urbino when he addressed Federico in an epigram praising the Duke's new palace. Quote, challenging Caesar and rival to the portals of the ancients at the crossroads of Urbino, your stately house stands firm. Most agree that it's a very beautiful building. Architectural appropriation of neighboring Mantua by Federico's friend and contemporary, the Marquis Ludovico Gonzaga, followed a similar pattern, raising questions concerning the notion of, a, of ideal city, claimed to have informed the rebuilding of these cities, as well as Pope Pius II's building of Pienza, their alleged paradigm. Pienza, was a village called Corsignano until the humanist Pope, an avid reader of Vitruvius, transformed it into a dynastic monument in keeping with the Vitruvian principles he espoused. And following the, the example of Caesar and Augustus, renamed after himself. Its monumental center is built around a small square, which the Pope in his memoirs calls a forum. His palace is on the right, with the bishopric on the left. At the center is a cathedral and opposite it, a town hall whose arcaded porch uh, here frames the view. There are a couple of things worth noting. First of all, the dates, 1459, 1462. The entire complex, which took just three years to construct, is a paradigm of what you might call Renaissance fast build. As Petrarch and other partisans of one man rule infused, princes got things done. Pluralistic communal administrations operated through debate and with all aspects of every construction project requiring detailed review by the various trade guilds that regulated them, under such circumstances, getting things done would take forever. Princes got things done. I'm reminded of the people who in the 1930s admired Mussolini for getting the trains to run on time. The second thing to notice here is that the city square at the center of the plan, a scenographic perversion of the com commune's traditional Piazza Comunale, has been reduced to insignificance at about half the size of the palace courtyard on the right. An ideal city, perhaps, but who's ideal? In 2016, Pienza was part of a UNESCO campaign called Save the Beauty. And it's a high time I said a few words about beauty. In his Art on the Art of Building, the first Renaissance treatise on architecture, Leon Battista Alberti famously defined beauty as, quote, the reasoned harmony of all the parts within a whole so that nothing may be added, taken away or altered, but for the worse. The touchstone of what may be called beautiful, in other words, is that it cannot, nor should it be, changed. Beauty, for Alberti, is immutable, a sign of permanence, which made it an attractive proposition for a war warlord seeking to consolidate his power. Beauty equals permanence. In February of this year, Matt Galloway, host of a CBC public affairs radio program called The Current, interviewed the Bangladeshi architect, Marina Tabassum, 
who at the time was visiting chair at the Daniels School of Architecture at the University of Toronto. Tabassum has worked extensively in refugee camps where she reported any attempt by their occupants to make their grim surroundings more attractive is actively discouraged by the camp's administrators, by planting gardens, for example. This is what Tabassum had to say about beauty. Quote, beauty is a word that's not welcomed in refugee camps. The directive from the government is that you cannot make anything attractive because beauty is associated with permanence. Beauty is associated with a feeling of home, and they don't want the refugees to feel at home. They should always be reminded that this is not home. You have to go back to where you belong, end quote. For Renaissance princes determined to make themselves at home in the cities they had take, taken over, beautiful buildings were a lasting reminder that they weren't going anywhere. Inscriptions inspired by ancient Roman epigraphy often re reinforced the message. Begun in 1450, the Tempio Malatestiano in Rimini is a church Alberti redesigned as a dynastic monument for Sigismondo Pandelfo Malatesta, the warlord who ruled the city. On the frieze, a Latin inscription, crisply chiseled in Roman capitals, reads Sigismondo Pandelfo Malatesta made this, 1450. The same legend is repeated in smaller letters over the door and in various locations inside the church. Sigismondo understood the power of a repeated message. So too did Federico da Montefeltro, whose palace wraps around what had originally been the city's Piazza Comunale, the square once bounded by the commune's in institutional buildings, now effaced. Above and below each of the eight windows overlooking the erstwhile public square, now the entrance court of, the, of uh, Federico's private residence, you read the ducal monogram, F.E. Dux, Federico Duke, repeated no fewer than 16 times. There was no mistaking who now owned the city. Renaissance princes idolized Julius Caesar, and it was generally agreed that the key to Caesar's, ast Caesar's astounding success was what the Romans called virtus, virtu in Italian. Virtu was a flamboyant mix of swagger, ruthless daring, military genius, and above all, virility. Virtus, after all, as Cicero pointed out, derives from vir, the Latin word for man. Virtu was a quality much prized by the new lords of city-states, seized for the most part of part by force of arms in northern Italy, where Vitruvius made his first major comeback. This made the opening lines of Vitruvius's treatise of particular interest, his dedication to Augustus Caesar, whose enemies, he writes, had been crushed by his invincible virtus, and even more important, his assertion that when he worked for the emperor's adoptive father, Julius Caesar, his knowledge of architecture was what had bound him to the great general's virtus. And it's really interesting that he says not he, his, his, his knowledge of architecture did not bind him to Caesar the man, but to Caesar's virtus. A subtle, a subtle change of emphasis. The appeal to ambitious princes of, a, of the Renaissance to the appeal to, the, to ambitious princes of the Renaissance of the notion of architecture as an indispensable second to the deployment of lordly virtu is the topic of chapter four, which explores the idea through the prevailing Caesarism of the day, as well as through the work of the architectural theorists who exploited it, notably that of Antonio Averlino, better known as Filarete, whose nickname is usually taken to mean lover of virtue. Filarete wrote his treatise on architecture for Francesco Sforza, the mercenary captain who seized Milan by force in the mid-15th century. Sforza appears enthroned at the center of this miniature, dressed as an ancient Roman general shaking hands with Julius Caesar on his right. The legend under the image explains that Sforza's virtus 
is what has earned him his place of honor among the ancient, uh, ancient heroes who surround him. Niccolo Machiavelli, who begins The Prince by distinguishing between hereditary and new principalities, singled out Francesca Sforza as a paradigm of what he calls a completely new prince. Francesco, he writes, using the right means and by his own great virtu for being a private citizen, became Duke of Milan. Machiavelli was not referring to Francesco Sforza's morals. One of the most innovative features of Filarete's treatise is his plan for a city called Sfortinda, or Sforza town, named for his patron. It's often referred to as the first ideal city of the Renaissance. Filarete has Francesco Sforza himself appear in the work as the very personification of virtù. In the statue he places on top of an overscale so-called Casa della Virtù, also called Casa Areti. It's one of the countless impossibly gigantic buildings which feature in this ideal city where size, as Filarete tells it, is a measure of worth. All the evidence points to the vir virtue Filarete's nickname proclaimed him to be a lover of as none other than the Virtù embodied in the patron he idolized in this image. On this reading, Filarete ceases to be a lover of virtue in the comfortable modern sense to become what can only be called a lover of power. Filarete, who wrote in Italian, called his treatise on, ar on architecture an architettonico libro or architectonic book. Excavation of the term architectonic in the context of the work's composition is the topic of chapter five. When Francesco Sforza seized Milan in 1450, he brought to an end a brief ill-fated attempt to restore communal government to the city. It was Vitruvius who provided Filarete with the warp into which he wove his own highly idiosyncratic narrative. A narrative which, with its ideal city of Sforzinda, assigned to architecture a leading role in Sforza's reinstatement of one-man rule at Milan, testifying to a preoccupation with what Aristotle wrote in his Nicomachean Ethics was the most architectonic of the arts. And for Aristotle, this most architectonic of the arts was not architecture, an art which in his day had as yet no name, but he politike in Greek, the political. The political potential of Filarete's treatise was taken to a new level when just 20 years after it was written, King Matthias Corvinus of Hungary commissioned the Italian humanist Antonio Bonfini to translate it into Latin. The translation, in large, lavishly illuminated manuscript format, was intended to join other volumes of the same kind in the king's famous library at Buda, which included a similarly ornate manuscript of Alberti's treatise commissioned at about the same time. As Maria Baltramini has shown, the translation entailed what she calls a Vitruvianization of the text passages where Filarete diverges from his Vitruvian source are not translated, but re replaced wholesale with the correct version from De Architectura itself, so-called correct version. Digressions are cut and references to the work's original Milanese context suppressed. In sum, this highly reductive Latin translation of Filarete's treatise stripped the work back to its Vitruvian warp, making it along with the man who commissioned it, Roman and therefore universal. In his dedication to his patron, the invincible Divo Mattia, Bonfini dismisses the electoral process whereby kings in Hungary traditionally won their thrones by vote, writing that Matthias's contested election was irrelevant. Virtu alone had earned him his coronation. 
Thus, hardly surprisingly, it's the red-headed Hungarian king himself who appears as virtu in this Latin version of Filaretti's so-called Architettonico Libro. In calling the treatise an ar architectonic book, Filarete points to a confluence of architecture and the political that brings into sharp focus the key dimension of the Renaissance love affair with Vitruvius. Like De Architectura itself, Filarete's Architectonico Libro and other architectural treatises of the Renaissance were conceived and written in political circumstances which cannot be overlooked if the full range of their theoretical significance is to be appreciated. The warlords, who were everywhere taking control of independent communes which in earlier centuries had governed themselves in keeping with the ideal of a common good whose values were the very antithesis of these princes' own, were all invariably horsemen. Horses, were indispensable accomplices in the never-ending quest for dominance. This bronze medal, where Francesco Sforza's portrait has been paired with the head of a warhorse, could hardly make this plainer. The very embodiment of a prince's virtu, horses became the consummate symbol of princely power with a proliferation of equestrian monuments that culminated at the end of the century with the gigantic three times life-sized bronze horse Leonardo da Vinci designed for a monument to honor the memory of Francesco Sforza. And it's interesting that Leonardo thought that this oversized horse, this gigantic bronze horse, would be the, the, the one work that would make his reputation. Unfortunately, it was never cast because the clay model was shot to pieces by the French and so on. But uh, it was the bronze horse that was going to was going to make his name for posterity. You know, not the Mona Lisa or any any <laughs> irrelevant minor works like that. So uh, makes gives you an idea of what how important these these bronze equestrian monuments were, especially when they were big. <laughs> My argument in chapter six is that endorsed by none other than Leon Battista Alberti, architecture became the operational equivalent of the princely war horse. An able courtier, exceptionally in tune with the tenor of his times, Alberti began his architectural career in Ferrara, where he wrote De Equo Animante, a short treatise on the living horse, for Lionello d'Este, the prince who ruled the city. Shortly afterwards, at Lionello's request, he began his On the Art of Building, the extremely influential treatise on architecture in which he rewrote Vitruvius for the would-be Caesar of his own day. But Alberti's treatise bypassed, finally you get a you get to see it. <laughs> but Alberti's treatise bypassed the iconic, well-proportioned male body known as Vitruvian Man, as the ultimate referent for the perfect correspondence of parts the ancient Roman author called Symmetria, to replace this perfectly proportioned human person with the body of what he calls an animans, an animal or living creature, paradigmatically a horse, as the embodiment of the harmonious correspondences that for Alberti conferred on a work of architecture, the beauty of an ideally unassailable whole. I would propose that in this age of princes, the living horse and not Vitruvian man is to be taken as Vitruvius's best, most fitting representative. With its focus on the political damage wrought during the Vitruvian revival of the Quattrocento, my book challenges conventional reverence for a Renaissance that remains ever vivid as a pinnacle of Western cultural achievement. Political ambition fueled the antique rebirth embraced by princes who routinely appealed to Roman grandeur as justification for their own lust for power. 
Vitruvius's impeccable, impeccable imperial credentials gave architecture al antica a key role in the fulfillment of that ambition and led to the creation of the ideal city so-called that left little or no trace of the real ones they displaced. <clears throat> and I'd like to finish with a few words by way of conclusion. In an effort to give this reassessment of Vitruvius a slightly broader um, historiographical context. Quote, people who imagine that history flatters them are impaled on their history like a butterfly on a pin and become incapable of seeing or changing themselves or the world, end quote. So wrote James Baldwin in an essay of 1965 called The White Man's Guilt. Needless to say, Baldwin was referring to white people in general, but I think that architects also share the guilt of people who imagine their history in exclusively flattering terms, typically embracing a view of architectural historiography as a self-congratulatory enterprise which produces inspirational literature that features Vitruvius, oracular source of timeless principles as a guiding light. Firmitas, utilitas, venustas, the cosmic resonance of Vitruvian man. Through investigation of early Italian Renaissance architecture undertaken as in candid recognition of what Machiavelli called la verità effettuale della cosa, things as they really are and not as they are imagined to be, I've sought to confront such flattering illusions with detailed evidence of architecture's collaboration with the politics of dominance that defined the age of princes under review. Challenging the conventional take on Filarete's alleged love of, view, of, alleged love of virtue is a case in point. To acknowledge historical complicity with princely ambition is to take a liberating first step away from participation in contemporary iterations of such power politics towards an awareness of their consequences and a desire to change them. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And uh, Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, about 15 minutes for uh, questions. Um, I see that uh, Jean, um, you have your hand raised. No, I was just applauding. That's oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it looks like oh, Allegra is also applauding. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody who applauded. <laughs> um, are there any questions? Everybody. I think there is a question in the chat. In the chat, where do I From see From Claudio. The I can read it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Chat. Um, Claudio says, is okay, there I'm reading it. I'm reading it. Is there a kind of beauty that can be amended from any implication of with power? Well, I, yeah, the whole question of, uh, first of all, uh, first of all, the power implied in taking hold of something that does not belong to the human being. I think so. What do you think? Well, this whole question of beauty is obviously the subject of much reflection and and uh, and revision i think the one the one caveat that i would insist on is that you cannot equate beauty with goodness beauty is something else beauty is beauty uh, and and to attach moral uh, a moral uh, value to beauty is 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 to go in the wrong direction i mean beginning with the greeks greeks you know kalas kagatos um, it was one word beauty Goodness, the, the man who was both beautiful and good, it was one word defined him, beauty good, the beauty good man, the beautiful good man. I think that has to be seriously questioned. There's nothing wrong with beauty as such. God knows I'm as susceptible to its charms as the next person. But um, but I think you have to you have to look very carefully on 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 I like I'm on, on on that question. It's something that I'm hoping to look more carefully on in the future yeah and does it belong to something other than the or that does does it something that to ask answer claudio's question does it belong to 
something other than the human being, uh, I, that is, I, I would have to ponder to be able to answer that that specific. <laughs> <laughs> that specific <laughs> yes yes uh, to to say something but well, if someone else has to, something to ask please go ahead go ahead claudia uh so no the maybe maybe it helps to think about a question raised when someone uh, was uh, recently writing a book on Albert Speer. Oh, yes. The, the question was... <laughs> can, That's, can who's, who's writing a book on Albert Speer? Leon Krier. Leon oh, Krier. well, wouldn't you know it? <laughs> <laughs> and the question was, can a criminal be a great architect? And uh, my, 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 no, the, the, the other question, the, the question I would raise to you is, can a great architect not be a criminal? I, I would, I would hope so, yes. Uh, no, yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> he, can, he must be a criminal. Oh, you think he, he must? Well, no, I, I, I think, you know, we have to. You have to allow a little subtlety in the, <laughs> in the, in the let's leave. Let's do it. Let's leave it. Yes. Nice to meet you, Claudio. I I, uh, I only know you. Uh, Very nice to meet writing. you. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Be happy to answer any any questions at all. What about ideal cities? Anybody got any questions about ideal cities? That's something else that I'm pondering. One new. I think we have another question in the chat. Uh, uh, I don't see where I'm, I've lost the chat. One new message. It is from oh, hi, Indra. Okay, Lisa. Okay. You said Vitruvius often, is often quoted but rarely read, but when will architects stop quoting Vitruvius? Should they be stop? Should they stop? No, I don't think there's any harm in quoting Vitruvius. Uh, I mean, as such, I mean, there's, it's a fairly neutral. Uh, I think where, where the harm comes in is when, um, when it becomes complacent, when your quote, quotation becomes, when, when you're citing a Vitruvius as kind of a complacent reinsurance, reassurance of whatever, uh, or a, a complacent uh, justification of, for whatever criminal <laughs> tack you decided to take in your work. Uh, no, that's a joke. Uh, but no, I don't think there's any harm in quoting Vitruvius. It's, it's, it's like everything, like so many things, it's, it's, it's to, what, uh, to what purpose is your quoting of Vitruvius done and also i think the complacency with which vitruvius has been taken as an authority without really examining uh what uh what uh what the context well i've, I've dwelt a lot of the context i mean there are ways of you know many ways to skin a cat you can there you, you can look at vitruvius without looking at the context that hasn't been my choice but if you do look at the context uh, um uh, it, it it puts an end to the kind of complacency that has has um, characterized so many readings uh, of of Vitruvius. What were the writings of Vitruvius? When were the writings of Vitruvius actually be discovered? Well, there's um yeah the Rosanna. Well, Rosanna. <laughs> um, uh, well, he was known in the Middle Ages, but well, it, the interesting thing, it's always been attached to some kind of imperial project. The first, the first record of Vitruvius being actually read and 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 quoted and followed or attempted to be was in the court of Charlemagne at Aachen in um in the eleventh century. Or no, before that, ninth century, actually. Um uh, but in Italy, uh in Italy it was Petrarch's rediscovery of the manuscript in the 1350s, as I said at the beginning of my talk, um, that uh, set, got the ball rolling in Italy, where, um, and then there was Poggio Bartolini's uh, discovery of 1416, which uh, sort of kept the ball rolling, and uh, and uh, then after that, nobody nobody really looked back. So, um, so that's that's yeah, that's a fairly simple and factual answer to your question. 
Hello, Franca. Thank you, Indra. Does the use of Vitruvius by other than those thousands of years, by those thousands of years later... Sorry, super... Indra, that was, that was a little too fast on my part. Let me try to uh, reiterate that. Does the use of Vitruvius by others, now thousands of years later, super, supersede the possible value of the disciplinary content and the information that the book offers? Could we say the same about Hippocrates' contribution? And if not, why would architecture be any more destined for power than the medicine? <laughs> well, I don't know much about medical history. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, comment on, on that. Uh, could, can Vitruvius still be useful? Yes, I think, yeah, certainly. I mean, certainly Vitruvius can be useful. And Vitruvius can, you can read Vitruvius and, and understand, you know, the workings of architecture uh, and thought about architectural theory above all, the how, how are, the, the role of architecture theory in the historical context. Uh, um, uh, you know, not, not, uh, not just as a, as a, as a manual for for building, um, which every everybody more or less agrees that that wasn't the the reason it was written in the first place. It had a completely different, um, uh, completely different intention. But yeah, I think Vitruvius can be read very usefully. Uh, uh, but you you know you have to. You, you, you can't just skim it and cherry pick the parts that sound good to you and make you feel warm and fuzzy. It's a, it's a, it's a more complicated issue. Uh, um, yeah. Nice of you to tune in, Franca. I don't see you. Where are you? Pleasure. I'm looking forward to reading, Indra. <laughs> okay, I'm even looking forward to receiving your book when it comes. Um, we've got a question from Berian. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Hi, it was a very big pleasure to listen to you talking about your book. I had the chance of reading it recently. Oh. And I'm very much indebted to your work in my research in general too. And <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> relating to the strong patronage aspect of the Renaissance architecture, um, where you mentioned Malatesta actually kind of have it on the churches yeah. Facade. La Testa yeah. made this. Same thing is happening for Santa Maria Novella. Ruccellai yeah. made this, where we know the architects exactly because we know them, it's written about, but it's the patron actually kind of putting it there as like the patron made it. So, well, the Romans, I, it was the same thing. The architects were not mentioned at all. I mean, ever. Uh, <laughs> Exactly. And the uh, the idea that authorship actually is something that belongs to the patron mm -hmm. rather than the architect. Um, do you kind of think that the fascination of the Renaissance architects like Alberti and Filarete kind of revived, revivalized, revi rediscovering Vitruvius and writing about Vitruvius, do you think that there's also... Um, uh, 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 under uh, underlying desire to make actually a, a partnership in that authorship of design or although it's not of course like Alberti built this it's the patron that built this no, no but but... having a name for the design like and because the architect as a title is also distinguishing itself from Capo Maestros at the time. Yes, right? yes, yeah, yeah. The whole thing changes actually that the whole role of the architect changes in the uh, Renaissance. The architect doesn't really get reborn until the Renaissance, uh, uh, as 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 you clearly. I think, yeah, and I think, um, I think, uh, yeah, the 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 idea that the architect's role is somehow bound up with the role of the patron. This becomes terribly important. I think that's that's a very good point, um, the, and that the architect's prestige and and, and prominence is. Uh, is 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 part and parcel uh, uh, of 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 the enhancement of the patron is extremely important in the Renaissance in a way that well there were no architects well there were master builders in the Renaissance and um, and and and, and, and I, yeah I think that's an excellent point and I think that's um, and I, I think I don't, I don't, brought it up brought it up 
I don't remember where I read exactly right now, but for instance, there are accounts where Gonzaga was before, but was referred as a good architect because he was building a lot of. Yeah, houses. yeah, that's in Filarete actually. Uh, but but the patron is being referred as like the architect, like Gonzaga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was well, they, again, somebody I can't remember who uh, writing about uh, Federico da Montefeltro calls him Vitruvius. I mean, you know, that's that's exactly. yes, like he is Vitruvius or like yeah, this architect. Yeah, 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 is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the patrons are also kind of holding on to. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. My pleasure. Tom Markey. Shaking hands with Julius Caesar seems a strange image. Octavian at least ushered in a Pax. Any relative any relative figures on which the two on which of the two was youth? On I'm sorry, I don't understand. Any relative figures on which of the two was useful to the Vitruvian tradition? Ah, oh, uh, uh, well, actually, Julius Caesar, I see what you're saying. Julius Caesar was the hero. Augustus was also a hero, but Julius Caesar was number one, partly because of Petrarch, I think, who started the whole thing going. Um, Petrarch idolized uh, uh, Julius Caesar. He wrote a bi biography of Julius Caesar. He was working on it until 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 the day he died um uh they were well i mean they, they, I, I don't know whether you can actually rank them saying yeah julius caesar was number one augustus was number two in terms of 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 the of the of the emperor most emulated i mean they 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 chose whichever one was useful when it came to the mounting of spectacles for example people referred to augustus um uh, uh, Coli d'Este, for example, uh, uh, picked Augustus as a model because he was a great one for mounting spectacles, and Augustus had been a great one for mounting spectacles as well. So I, I don't know whether it's particularly useful to to say who was the more <laughs> who was the more popular emperor in the, in the Renaissance. They were all popular, but I think I think if you had to choose, you'd have to say Julius Caesar. There were five times as many manuscripts of Caesar's commentaries. Uh, uh, in the 15th century than there were of Vitruvius, sort of gives you an idea. And 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 Augustus didn't leave anything except the raised gesti, which weren't discovered until, I don't know, 19th century or something. So, so yeah, part of it's the survival of Julius Caesar's writings in which, he, in which Caesar himself makes him a hero, makes himself a hero. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, not at all. My pleasure. Um, quickly, Andre, did you have a question? Saw your hand raised. Hi, uh, no worries. Uh, thank you so much for the lecture and the book. It's uh, fantastic to hear. And you asked for a question on the ideal city. Yeah. Uh, so, and I, I was very impressed with Marina's uh, Tabassum quote that you made about yeah. this relation with permanence. Yeah. How would you see this? Uh, lack of permanence as a form for the ideal city? That's a very good question. Actually, <laughs> I imagine most of you saw the film Oppenheimer this summer. It was the big summer blockbuster, or one of the two, the other was Barbie. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, uh, I've I've been. It's it's the the whole idea of a, ideal city is is is. Well, I, I mean, the, the, a lot has been written about them. Every everything from you know the Mexican city, whatever it was called, uh, before Mexico City existed. That's in the, there's a book on ideal cities, and everything is in there, and it's completely indiscriminate. But I think that's that's a topic that that. Um, uh, that merits a, a closer reflection. And to get back to Oppenheimer, I had, I had this idea. I had, had this idea that you might even think about Los Alamos as an ideal city with Oppenheimer strutting around on his horse as a 20th century war, warlord or prince, war, warrior prince. I mean, warrior prince in that case is like, he's a warrior prince beyond any warrior prince is imagining, right? It's, uh, there's a story there and and I think it's worth working on. And I think also if, if I did that, or if, if one did that, you might be able to get closer to, to, to this whole idea of what an ideal city. I mean, there are those three famous panels and 
And well, one of the things that I always pointed out to my students is there's no people in those panels, right? The, the three, the one in Berlin, the one in uh, Baltimore and, and one in uh, Urbino. Uh, beautiful buildings, no people. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up, but I don't know if I have, um, I have certainly don't have a, a, a definition of ideal city out that the, <laughs> on, on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> I think we have time for one more. Um, there's just one more question in the chat. Uh, I don't see. Susan? Uh, I Patty. apologize, I must go. Patty, question. Yeah. How did Vitruvius consider the connection between the countryside and the city? And do those ideas give additional insight into how his works were used in Roman times or by the princes um, of the Renaissance. Um, I don't know that he actually did consider, I mean, in the text, that he actually did consider what kind of relationship there was between the countryside and the city. Uh, I, I mean, he does talk about um, country residences, that's for sure. Um, and he certainly talks about cities, um, but I don't think he he really talks about, you know, well, the relationship between the two, like, you know, Otium, uh, Otium and Negotium, Negotium belonging to the city and Otium belonging um, to what you what you did in your country villa, the rest and relaxation aspect of Roman aristocratic uh, life. Certainly in the Renaissance, certainly Alberti, Petrarch, um, I can't think of Anybody else offhand, but those are two major ones. Both were very anti-city, uh, Alberti as well. Um, and uh, he was, you know, for him, ideal cities, you know, he had to get rid of the beggars and all kinds of stuff like that. It was pretty high-handed. Um, but uh, yeah, to, 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 to um, I really can't think of anywhere where there's a discussion of, 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 of uh, you know how the countryside should relate to the city. Obviously, the countryside fed the city, and that was that was that went without saying. But I don't think it's <clears throat> I don't think it's discussed. Um, one person who would discuss. Well, actually, that's not one hundred percent true. In the preface to book two, there's that story about Dinocrates, you know, who strips naked and goes to visit Alexander the Great because he's looking for for business, and he presents him with a model of uh, uh, as as an as a as a, an example of the kind of work he's capable of, he presents Alexander with um, uh, Mount Athos shaped into the body of a man, and Mount the, the the man the 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 man the man mountain in one hand is 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 holding a, a a vessel of water, and in the other he's holding a city. And Alexander says to Dinocrates, "I like your looks, babe, but." Uh, but how is that city going to survive? Because there's no food coming in. Uh, but that didn't, you know, I mean, he still took he still took Dinocrates on and spent the rest, you know, founded Alexandria and whatever else. But uh, yeah, so there's that's one one instance where the the actual connection between city and and country country as a as a as a, as a supply source uh, does come up. But I. I Offhand, I can't think of of, of, of any other. Um, does that help at all? Thank you. You're welcome. I think we're out of time, but thank you so much, Andra, for coming and speaking with us um, about your book. And um, I hope everyone has a great afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Depending on where you are. Thanks very much again for inviting me. Thanks everyone for for coming and um, maybe meet again somewhere. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.